Support for the Capital Connection comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us this week is Republican New York State Assembly Minority Leader William Will Barclay. Leader Barclay, great to have you back with us. You've been a terrific correspondent. How are you feeling? I'm doing well. Thank you. We're feeling good. We're glad Election Day is behind us. And now we're looking forward to uh, you know, starting the session up and trying to make this state a better place. Congratulations are in order, of course. You have been reelected as minority leader of the New York State Assembly. You've now held the role since January 2020, first elected to the Assembly in 2002. So tell me, how does it feel to keep getting reelected? Do you feel good about that? <laughs> well, I, I guess it's better than the alternative of not getting elected. So I appreciate that. But it's been an honor for me to serve as leader over these last few years and get reelected. Uh, I always say the reason this job is such a good job is because I have great members of our conference who are really dedicated, uh, as I said, to making New York State a better place. And they work with some wonderful people on staff, so they make the job, uh, well, not always like any job. Is some days are be better than others, but uh, for the most part, it's been an enjoyable undertaking, and I feel like we are making a difference. Will, you come from a political family. How has that affected you? Well, we, we've talked about this on the show before. You know, my father was in the state senate from 64 to 84, and he provided me some great advice over the years, and I still use that advice uh, from time to time. And, you know, he always said, you know, when you can get along with the other side, don't take things personally and keep your nose to the grindstone, work hard. And you can, even though, you know, sometimes we get knocked around a little bit saying you can't get anything done in the minority, which I find is completely not accurate. You know, if you work hard and do what you're supposed to do, uh, you can do get things done. And that's what I've tried to do over my political career. Did he tell you anything about how to handle the press? <laughs> You know, he told me, I don't always follow this. He told me, always talk to the press if you have the opportunity. And I do that. I try to, try to do that. Uh, for the most part, uh, I have a good relationship, and I think, you know, they try to do what's fair. But I would say 99% of the time, that's the case. It's that 1% which tends to upset us, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. <laughs> okay, so I see that your colleague in the Senate, Republican Bob Ort, has been reelected New York State Senate Minority Leader. What's your relationship like with him? Uh, it's very good. Um, in fact, uh, I would say from the Republican perspective, we are as lined as we've ever been in my political uh, career. Uh, I think Rob is trying to accomplish some of the things that we're trying to accomplish in the assembly. Uh, it's very hard for anybody to get their voices heard uh, in Albany, but when you can work with a partner like Rob Ward, I think it gives Republicans a lot of voice. So we've we've had a good relationship. I congratulate him on his reelection. Look forward to working with him uh, this upcoming session. You know, the midterm elections have come and gone. Republicans in New York did particularly uh, well in Congress, winning five seats and helping put Republicans in the majority in the House. What's your take on the recent election wins and losses in New York? Yes, I was pleased. I was pleased with our conference. We won at least five seats. We may have won up to seven. We'll see. There's unfortunately still court cases and recounts uh, going on. Uh, but I think ultimately it, uh, it illustrated, particularly in the city where we picked up, we have our largest delegation in the city, we picked up four or five seats uh, there. Um, so that 
that's really uh, very special. And uh, I think it's crime. You know, I think the ultimately people, one of the number one things that you can do as an elected official is make sure your communities are safe. And unfortunately, because of some democratic policies like raise the age, bail reform, the anti-police narrative, et cetera, uh, people are no longer feeling safe on their streets, and they they made the Democrats pay uh, in the voting booth. What's made you enthusiastic about your chances? Do you really think that Republicans in blue state New York can make this work? I do. Again, you know, for us to be in the majority, that might be a bit of a stretch. But we've always said we don't need to be in the majority. All we need to do is add to our numbers. It makes governing more difficult, particularly to push progressive policies. And that's really what we want to do is try to put a stop to some of these ill-informed uh, socialist type policies that the Democrats, unfortunately, over the last few years have been implementing. So I am optimistic. I continue to be optimistic. I think particularly in New York City, some of the uh, communities can be very difficult uh, to break into. And I think we were able to do that successfully. Uh, we have an Asian American uh, we have a, a number of Russians in those communities. Once you get in there, they can see, wow, this Democratic Party isn't the only option out there. There are Republicans. They can be effective, and actually they hold the viewpoints that I hold, and uh, maybe we can expand on those numbers in coming elections. So what is it, Will Barclay, that makes New York Cityers so Democratic in their orientation? Does that bother you? Sure. I mean, I think it's traditional. It goes back, you know, several generations probably, uh, but that doesn't mean it has to be like that forever. And again, if they continue to pass these policies, particularly when it comes crime, I think it's probably the one that comes to mind the most, but even economic policies and dealing with inflation, uh, downstaters aren't uh, immune to that. And we certainly feel it here upstate. Uh, So, again, I'm optimistic that uh, things can change. So now that, you know, you've gone through an election successfully, I think, winning five seats and helping put Republicans in the majority in the House, what's your take on the recent elections? Um, Do you think think Republican ascendancy is happening? Well, (laughs) I guess it's how you define the term ascendancy. But, yes, we are certainly on the move up. And I think, again, we'll have a stronger voice in Albany. Certainly we'll have a stronger voice in Washington. I think that will ultimately help the party and help the direction that the state and the nation is on. I think the more interesting part of the equation is what the Democrats will learn from this election. Will they continue to pass far left policies or will they understand that that's not popular with the voters and maybe they ought to start moderating those policies. The other interesting thing I think straight up is what the governor does. And, uh, you know, she's got a court of appeals appointee she's got to make. There's the progressives are arguing that she needs to follow a number of political litmus tests, and uh, uh, ethnic litmus tests, et cetera. And it'll be interesting to see if she caves to the progressives like she has been doing or whether after this election she realizes that going far left isn't a popular political move and maybe she'll move more to the middle. Can you give me an example, Will Barclay, of the tendency to move far left? You keep saying far left. What has she done that is she? Yeah. Well, let's take crime, for instance. There's some very what I think I would categorize as common sense changes that could be made particularly bail reform and to raise the age where you're not throwing out the policy wholesale, but you're just changing to make it better. And an easy one's judge's discretion with bail reform. She has refused to do that. She could have used her political capital any time last year and probably could have gotten it done, but she doesn't want to do it because she didn't want to offend uh, the hard left of her party. So the same with economic, look at the economic issues. I mean, we spent Last year, like drunken sailors, $220 billion budget. That's not sustainable. You would hope a governor who has to represent this whole state had to get reelected would bring some sanity probably into our spending. But instead, she again caved and went crazy uh, on spending. We're going to be paying for that, I think, in these this year, but definitely the out years. What do you make of New York City Mayor Eric Adams' plan to remove people with severe untreated mental illness from the streets. That will mean, of course, involuntary hospitalization of people deemed unable to care for themselves. Is this a good idea? Should we be removing? Well, yeah. Yeah, I think, I don't know the specifics of what he's proposing. I've heard that. I, I haven't even read a story on it, so I, I get a little hesitant to comment on it one way too strongly. This is what I would say, though. What I do know, they're having a problem, particularly on the subway, with crime and you know people being assaulted and attacked. 
there has something has to be done. And if it's, you know, I think it's true, many of these people have mental illnesses, just leaving them back out on the street isn't always the best, certainly not best for uh, the community, but it's not best for the individual. And to get them some help is the right thing to do, I think. Other than there has to be obviously some balance in that and some due process. So I'd, I'd be curious what I guess I'm just not educated enough to know exactly what he's proposing, but in my instinct says he's on the right track on that. I think it would be better for everybody in the end, uh, provided we, you know, we don't want to, you know, run over civil liberties so we can lock anyone up or, you know, institutionalize anybody. You say that you're looking forward to getting back to Albany to make New York safer, more affordable, and more prosperous for families and businesses. Let's start with making New York safer. You know, I worked with the New York City Police Department for a while. That's a tough job. How do you, how do you make them safer? Well, the first thing we do is stop uh, passing laws that are making people less safe. I mean, it's we just back got to the election. Now we hear about uh, things like elder parole, clean slate, et cetera, a uh, piece of legislation that I think ultimately will not uh, make New Yorkers safer. So we prevent those things from going in effect. And, then, again, we need to – look back at some of the policies that were already passed. And what I would suggest, you don't have to listen to me, but listen to the prosecutors, listen to New York City police officers, listen to the law enforcement around the state, see what they're telling you, and don't just discard what they do and just go off and do something, you know, wholly uh, different than what they think is effective. And I think we can, we can make changes in that way. And by the way, it's not, as you know, it's not just Democrat, Republican fighting these issues. You have the DA in Albany County, Soros, who's a uh, you know, Democrat. One time was, you know, the apple of, um, oh, who's the guy, the New York City billionaire, Soros, uh, and then uh, of his eye. And then even he's saying you need to reform, bail reform. You have the mayor of New York City saying you have to uh, bring reform. So why not bring those people together? Let's talk about it and see what we can do. Well, will you remind everybody what bail reform would look like? Well, you know, now they can't incarcerate somebody, you know, like give an appearance ticket, and there's no, you can't use cash bail uh, on a lot of crimes. We could expand some of those crimes that you could use bail so you can basically incarcerate somebody uh, instead of just letting them back right back out in jail. One thing we would like to do, I think, is giving judges discretion. So if the person that's being um, prosecuted is um, a danger to the community. The judge can make that decision. Other states that have done, gone to cashless bail, uh, have used this dangerous standard. I think New Jersey, for one, and it doesn't seem like this. You know, their, their crime situation doesn't seem to be as bad as it is in New York City. So maybe that's something we can uh, we can find some compromise on. Huh. So you say you want to make New York more affordable. How do we do that? Does this just mean lower taxes? What about affordable housing? It's a huge issue, which adds to the homeless problem, doesn't it? It does. But again, some of these things I think are causing the problem instead of helping the problem. We talk about a lot of the rent control and the inability to evict tenants. And this makes it harder for anyone to want to be in the business of a landlord. In fact, you don't see low-income billion unless it's heavily subsidized by the government. I think sometimes if you got government out of the system, we'd probably do a lot better than what we're uh, what we're doing. But, yeah, there are things, obviously, there are things that government can help with and ought to do. Uh, but ultimately, in New York, when you compare us to the rest of the country, we spend in tax <clears throat> way in excess. And as a result, Alan, as you're aware, we're losing people. We lost over a million people in the last decade, and they're going to lower-cost states like Florida, like Texas, et cetera. And, you know, people are moving with their feet. So what we have, I think, unfortunately, is a system that's simply not sustainable. And we have to bring back fiscal reality. When you're talking $220 billion budget, you compare it to states like Texas, you compare it to states like Florida have much lower budgets and seem to be providing, you know, maybe equivalent types of services. So you got to ask, where are we paying all this money for and what are we getting in return? Can you point to some place that you are particularly offended by the way we're spending money in New York? Uh, I always say this, because it seems like a question you get at. It's not so much we have to cut spending. What we have to do is slow the growth of spending. And a great area, I, you know, education is probably one of the biggest, education and healthcare are the two biggest things that we spend money on. 
I want to make sure that our schools are appropriately funded so they can provide great education to our kids. But we have a system that's inequitable where we're sending a lot of money to high wealth school districts. If we just, you know, lower the amount we send to high wealth school districts and reallocate it to low wealth school districts, we wouldn't have to yeah, continue the huge increases in education spending that we've done year over year. So some of it's not just, all right, well, let's cut, you know, $5 billion out of your budget. It's more of a reallocation of how the money's been, have it spent more efficiently, and uh, we don't have to increase the spending as much. The other thing is, you know, government can do things much better than what we've been doing. When you look at the unemployment insurance, you probably saw that they think, I think we spent something like $70 billion during the pandemic for unemployment benefits, and now they think something like $11 billion of that is fraudulent. I mean, right there, if you hear that, even cut that in half, think of the big budgetary impact that could have. Yeah. So how do you make New York more affordable? Well, I think the trajectory we're on is problematic. And so what we have to do is change that trajectory, change the tax and spend policies that we have, spend less. As a result, we can tax less. And that just okay. Okay. So, build uh, on itself. okay. so where are we spending too much money? Well, that's what I kind of just went through. You could say right through the whole budget, $220 billion. How come New York you have a state like California that spends $260 billion. They have twice the population of New York. So why is New York such an outlier on our spending? I would say because we spend more than anybody in health care. We spend more than anybody in education. We spend more. Probably you name, go down the line, you're going to look and you'll see we are spending more than anyone else. So if you look at that, how are other states getting by? How are other states citizens able to survive and we can't survive? By not spending more money, so there, I think there's a lot of ways of going. As I mentioned, there's a, there's efficiencies. You can have smarter spending that it actually is going to programs that are you know working, and maybe even getting the fraud out of the system probably could save us a ton of money. We're talking with New York State Assembly Minority Leader William Will Barclay. Always great to have you with us, uh, Will. Have you talked directly with the governor? I haven't. I haven't talked to the governor in a in a long time. How come? I don't know. Uh, For whatever reason, she doesn't seem open to uh, communication with the minority, but we'll see. We do have staff interaction, so it's not completely a silent thing, but me personally, I have not uh, spoken with the governor. Well, do you fault her for that? Uh, A little bit. Yeah, I do. You know, when she came in, I I reached out and we had a nice conversation, and it was a conversation where you would say, well, we're not going to agree on much, but where we can find areas of common agreement let's work together on those and that was that's about it um so i i don't know she excluded us from the both rob and myself from the inauguration she doesn't you know uh from the state of the state she doesn't recognize the minority so i don't know what her mentality is on doing that other than maybe trying to sell the picture that uh you know again the minorities can't get anything done, which again I, I strongly just you know, agree with. So, but sometimes that's the narrative that the majorities and the Democrats like to put out. It serves their purpose, even though it's inaccurate, and maybe that's what she bought into. I don't know. Okay, so now party chairman, your party chairman Nick Langworthy won the twenty third district congressional race. So that leaves you with a little bit of a problem. Who you got for his replacement as the GOP chair? <laughs> a little bit of a problem. Well, yeah. it could be an opportunity, too. I, again, I, some people have expressed their interest in doing it. Uh, well, I think, first of all, it's up to the party to decide. Uh, and we'll see um, see where that goes. As of right now, I don't think there's anyone that would say, you know, is a clear front. Runner. I think there's some people that could do it if they wanted to. But, it's, it's you know, it's a tough job. Some people don't want it undertake that challenge. So what's the future for Lee Zeldin from Long Island? I, well, I hope he continues to have a, you know, continues to use his voice in politics. Uh, I think the congressional delegation, and certainly I know in our conference, we owe a lot for Lee uh, running as well as he did and coming as close as he did to winning the governorship. Obviously, I was disappointed with those results, but you can't deny his coattails helped many candidates. So, and I think what was impressive with Lee was his ability to stay on message throughout that throughout the campaign. It was he was laser focused, and he never wavered from that message. And I think that, to some extent, uh, made the race as close as it, uh, it was. So, I hope he continues to have a voice. I know he's. I think I haven't talked to Lee about it, but I, I think he was wants to be national chairman, Republican chairman. 
So hopefully that'd be great for New York if he's successful in that undertaking. If not, uh, again, I hope he continues to be a voice in the Republican Party in New York State at least. So New York State has uh, recently awarded marijuana licenses to those who are hurt by the draconian Rockefeller drug laws. And there's also financial opportunity for farmers in New York to grow cannabis. Are Republicans embracing this new industry? I mean, it creates jobs and opportunities for small farmers who have suffered in New York. On the other hand, you know, marijuana has a sort of bad reputation. What do you think? <laughs> well, I can't speak for every Republican, so I think there is a divergence to some degree on this issue. I can speak for myself, however, that I don't think it's the proper uh, way to go. And just how this program's laid out and being rolled out, you realize how inept uh, government is sometimes, and they can't even get this thing straight. And I also think these things, uh, like we've seen with maybe other things like casino gambling, et cetera, where people make the predictions of how great this is going to be for an mm-hmm. economic powerhouse, mm-hmm. uh, I'm not so sure that's going to turn out to be the case. I think ultimately, uh, because there'll be so much government regulation and rules and re- on this saying that people will just continue to – people who want to smoke marijuana continue to purchase it illegally and not purchase it, you know, well, or whatever, we'll- license – well, Will Story. Barclay, you know I'm going to ask you this. Have you smoked? <laughs> have you? Have, have you, I? Have you? Yes. I told you I did in college in Amsterdam where it was legal. Yeah. And you miss it? I didn't. I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Alan, I have a weakness. Once in a while I have a scotch, so that's that's my weakness. Yeah, yeah. You think that's Marina, a, Marijuana is not one of them. Do you think there's a big difference between getting high on marijuana or getting high on scotch? You know, that's a very good question. I get asked that quite a bit. I, I don't probably not, you know, I don't know what the what the effects one are on the other and people's capacity to, you know, continue to do whatever they need to do. I'll say this, though. Culturally, we've had for, you know, ever alcohol as part of our culture. And I think that we have enough problems with alcohol to think that mm-hmm. all of a sudden we're not going to have problems with marijuana. I think this is a long way of looking at it. And I do think marijuana use has been shown no, not with everybody i'm not naive to that but it can be shown as a gateway into other more problematic drugs and so i just think it's the wrong way to go forward with it you know we had a system where we weren't really prosecuting you know marijuana but we still had it illegal and you know it seems to me that's not a bad way of going about this because once you put the government stamp of approval on it uh, i just think and you're already seeing the numbers going up particularly with younger younger people. I, I just think that's the wrong way to go and to say, well, alcohol is no worse. Well, we have a lot of problems with alcohol, too. I'm not saying we should outlaw alcohol, but I don't think that's a great thing to point to and say, hey, it's not even worse than this one with all the problems we have already with alcohol. So I, it just seems to me the wrong direction to be going in. Well, you know, Will Barkley, I'll be honest with you. Here I am, you know, a little older now. Um, I've never smoked marijuana, not in my life. I told that to my classes and they would all laugh. And... <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would all laugh. You know, there I was at the time with a bearded professor, you know, sloppily dressed, and they couldn't believe the image. Um, how about you? How about me what? How about you and drug use? Have you in, in uh, As I said, I, I've never done any drugs. I have smoked marijuana, but I was in Amsterdam when I was in college. Right. But I haven't partook in any other drugs. Is that the question you asked me? Yeah, that's sort of the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, it. <laughs> so, so the president of the United States, what grade would you give him right now, the Democrat? Uh, maybe a D minus. That's pretty low. How come? Maybe so an F, F plus. Well, look at where we stand. We, I mean, nothing has really been resolved from, you know, what he said years ago, or at least a year ago, what he was going to do. We still have inflation. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's any direction. Uh, I have no idea what his plan is to solve any of the problems uh, that we face. I think his foreign policy has not been uh, particularly strong. We see gas prices going through the roof. Um, it really, it seems like what he wants to do is just more government handouts, which I just don't think is the right way to go. So it really is hard for me to even point to something I could say, you know, this Biden, one thing he's done has been great on this issue. So how come, if that's also true, the Democrats keep winning these elections? Well, that, that's great. And I'm looking forward to getting a debriefing nationally what happened. I think one thing that over happened in this election is a lot of people thought Republicans were going to do this huge wave, but there wasn't a lot of areas where they could do uh, a big wave. You know, in this U.S. Senate, 
uh, I don't think they had a lot of um, open seats that they could be competitive in. I think it was one of these cycles where the Republicans were at disadvantage because their incumbents weren't running and they had open seats that Democrats could win. And then in the in congressional thing, everybody talks about a way, but there's not a lot of all the seats, you know, it's gotten so um, divided in the country. All the seats that Republicans usually can win, I think they won them in the past election. So with this even divide in the country, you know, the Republicans didn't do great on election night, but maybe with some more dispassionate uh, uh, review of the election, you're going to see we didn't do too badly either. Uh, but was it, you know, you would think with an unpopular president coming up, you know, this mid, usually traditionally in these years, uh, you know, the president gets clobbered. That didn't seem to be this case here, but yeah. we'll see. We'll see next time will be a presidential election. And it'll really be a uh, referendum on how well Biden's doing. I have to say thank you very much for spending all this time with us, leader William Barclay. And we are always excited when you come on the program because you offer a perspective. So we're out of time. Our guest has been New York State Republican Assembly Minority Leader William Barclay. Again, William, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Good talking to you. is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262 or visit us online anytime at wamc.org or just schedule a podcast anywhere you get your podcasts. And join us again next week at this same time for another political conversation. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.